Today we've got a nice functional equation which comes from my favorite calculus book, actually maybe my favorite textbook in general. So it's Calculus by Michael Spivak. You can find it in my Amazon store linked below if you're interested. So I really like this book if you can't tell. I've done a couple of problems from it. So our goal is to determine all continuous functions going from the positive real numbers to the real numbers. And so I've denoted the positive real numbers by this interval from zero to infinity. And these functions must satisfy the following equation. So we have f of x times y equals f of x plus f of y for all x, y. Of course, these x, y must come from the positive real numbers. So what this in fact is, is like classifying all continuous homomorphisms from the multiplicative group of positive real numbers to the additive group of all real numbers. So I think it's pretty interesting to look at it that way as well. Okay, great. So let's maybe get started. So let's define the following function, which will be some sort of like compositional transformation of our function f. So we'll call it g of x, and g of x will be f of x composed with the exponential function. So in other words, it's f of e of x. And since f is continuous, and e to the x is continuous, then we know g of x is also continuous. Now you might be a little bit worried that um, there could be problems with our domain, but let's recall that the range of e to the x is positive real numbers, so that's okay. Everything in the range of e to the x is allowed to be plugged in to f of x. After this substitution, we'd probably like to somehow use this rule over here. And here's how we can do it. So let's maybe take x and y in the positive real numbers and then look at g of x plus y. So that's going to be equal to f of e to the x plus y just by our definition of g of x. But using exponent rules, that's f um, of e to the x times e to the y. Then using our rule over here, our like um, defining characteristic of our function, this is f of e to the x plus f of e to the y. But then using the definition of g, this is g of x plus g of y. So we've reduced this problem a little bit. And how we've reduced it is to classify all functions g that again go from positive real numbers to real numbers, satisfying this functional equation right here. So g of x plus y equals g of x plus g of y. In other words, it's a linear function. So it's pretty commonly known that all linear functions take a certain form, but we'll prove that coming up. So in the last board, we made the substitution g of x equals f of e to the x. And then we saw that g of x satisfied the rule that g of x plus y was g of x plus g of y. And now we'd like to prove the following claim, which is that g of x equals a times x for some real number a. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. We'll start by proving it for natural numbers. So let's say we'll take n, which is a natural number, and then note that g of n plus one is equal to g of n plus g of one. That's just by our rule that we can separate this addition out as follows. But now let's write this as g of n plus a. So in other words, we're setting a equal to g of 1. And then we can take this equation and prove by induction that g of n is equal to a times n. So let's make that like a subclaim within this proof. So for all natural numbers n, we have g evaluated at n is equal to a times n. So our little proof of this will be by induction, which means we first need some sort of base case. And let's observe that our n equals 1 base case is very simple because g of 1 equals a times 1, given that a was defined to be g of 1. Let's maybe underline both of these just to show that that's how a was defined. 
Okay, now we can make an induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for some k, which is a natural number, we have g of k is equal to n times k. And now let's look at g of k plus 1. Well, using this additive rule, we see that that is g of k plus g of 1, which is equal to a times k plus a, which is equal to a times k plus 1, which is exactly what we need. So putting this all together, we have our claim proved. In other words, for all natural numbers, g has the right form. And now we'd like to move this to all rational numbers. Well, let's notice that g of 1 over n is exactly equal to 1 over n times the sum of n total g of 1 over n. So just to reiterate, these are n total g of 1 over n. And that's just because n over n is equal to 1. But now we can push all those together and we have 1 over n times g of 1 over n added to itself n times, which is equal to 1. So the calculation that we did right here is 1 over n plus all the way up to 1 over n. Great. And now we see that g of 1 over n is exactly equal to what we want, 1 over n times g of 1, which is a times 1 over n. And now we can play the same game with an arbitrary rational number. Let's take g of m over n, and we can write this as m times g of 1 over n. I skipped a little bit of a step here where I expanded this into g of 1 over n added to itself m total times. But then g of 1 over n is this a times 1 over n. Putting things all together, we get a times m over n. So let's see where we are so far. So at this moment, we see that g of x equals a times x for all positive rational numbers um, x. So how do we move that from all positive rational numbers to all real numbers? So let's just recall that this has to hold for all positive real numbers x. Well, the movement from all positive rational numbers to all real numbers is immediate because we have this condition that f was continuous and thus g is continuous. So I won't write down the details for that, but I think it'd be a nice homework exercise if you want to. So just to reiterate what our steps were, we proved that this sort of rule right here gave us the right form for our function on natural numbers. Then we expanded that to reciprocals of rational numbers. That was quickly expanded to all rational numbers. All of that came just from our additive rule. And then continuity brought us to all positive real numbers. Okay, so now that we've proven this claim, it's a short step to get an idea of what this function is. So let's do that. We just finished proving that if we composed our exponential function within our goal function, we got a linear function. So g of x was equal to a times x for some real number a. And this held for all real numbers x or positive real numbers x. So now let's see if we can take this home. So that tells us that f of e to the x is equal to g of x, which is equal to a times x. And now we're going to compose something within this. And what we'll compose within this is the natural logarithm to cancel out this exponential. So just to look at all of the details, we have f of x is the same thing as f of e to the natural log of x, which is the same thing as g of natural log of x, which is the same thing as a times natural log of x. So deleting out the middle, we see that f of x is equal to a times natural log of x. And now how can we get the value of a? Well, let's evaluate this at x equals e because natural log of e is 1. So that's going to give us f evaluated at e is equal to a times the natural log of e. But then the natural log of e is just 1, so that means that we get a is equal to f of e. 
But that being said, A is still a free parameter. So if we wanna think about this in its most general form possible, it would be something like this. So F of X is equal to A times natural log of X where, like I said, A could be any real number. So we have this family of functions that satisfies this rule over here. Now, looking at this a little bit more carefully, let's recall the logarithm rule that says the log base anything, maybe base B of X times Y equals the log base B of X plus the log base B of Y. So how do we link these two things together? Because this means that the log base B satisfies this rule over here. Well, in fact, we can do that just by choosing A to use our change of base formula. So notice that the log base B of XY is the same thing as the natural log of XY over the natural log of B, just by logarithm rules. So I guess what I'm getting at here is what we've proven is that if something has this rule which is satisfied by the logarithm, then it is essentially some sort of logarithm. And that's a good place to stop.